everybody and welcome back to the Ocean Impact Podcast. My name is Amelia Helton. I'll be one of your co-hosts for today. And as usual, I am joined by the man himself, Tim Silverwood. Hi, Tim. Hi, Amelia. Great to be here again. And uh, well, what do you know? Another fascinating Ocean Impact Podcast episode. I feel like we just can't help but have amazing, fascinating and innovative people on this show. (laughs) It's what we do best. Exactly. Today we have a fantastic episode with Sarin Chalala from Next Protein, who were the uh, Ocean Impact Pitch Fest 2021 uh, Sustainable Harvesting Spotlight Award winners. Um, And that is an award that was sponsored by Austral Fisheries. And we're very happy to say that Austral Fisheries are back this year to uh, again present this awesome Spotlight Award. Uh, Tim, what are your thoughts? You know, sustainable harvesting, these guys just are so fascinating. Uh, It's a great category. Yeah, look, we as a species around this planet rely upon oceans for protein and for a range of other needs. And so we understand that that uh, harvesting is a part of the future, but we also acknowledge just how poorly it can be done and has been done perhaps in the past. So very happy to be working with Austral Fisheries, who are an absolute global leader in the sustainability and the conscious approach that they take to their fisheries. And so, yeah, we're looking again in PitchFest 2022 for a spotlight who is working on a sustainable model for ocean harvesting to receive a cash prize, but of course, the, the huge exposure and accolade that comes along with it. And I think it was pretty unanimous last year when the judges put their attention to the sustainable harvesting category that Next Protein come up up trumps because it really is an incredible model that uh, perhaps, Amelia, you're going to tell us a little bit about. I am indeed. So um, Next Protein produce an insect-based protein for animal feedstocks um, and their, their quest is to accelerate sustainable agriculture and tackle resource scarcity, which we know is an issue. Um, and they do this by utilising food waste, which is so key. We know that you know food waste contributes a lot to um, the climate crisis. It's a huge uh, cause of emissions. Um, and the, the other interesting thing about their technology or insect technology, as they call it, uh, is this solution has the ability to address plant nutrition as well. So it's really cyclical. Everything comes back kind of to the earth, right? And um, the way that Sarin described it, and Tim, you can shed a little more light on this potentially, is that um, through this process that they do, this uh, insect technology, there's kind of different parts and they're able to extract different things as a part of that process before they end up at the the protein itself. Is that right? Yeah, look, what they've basically done is figured out how to create a range of products from this incredible process that they've pioneered. So, yeah, I just ab- anything which uses food waste uh, to create something beneficial to the planet and to humans is like such a big tick in my book because I just know how dire and how diabolical the whole food waste crisis is. We've got people all across this planet starving and really struggling with their own resources, yet in so many advanced cultures, we just create obscene amounts of waste. It just does my head in, as I'm sure it does many other people. So yeah, they get three main products out of it, Next Meal, Next Oil, and Next Grow. And Next Grow, I believe, is a, a fertilizer product as well. So they've been able to kind of find different customers for different products. And that's probably one of the things I found really fascinating with their application to PitchVest and obviously pitching themselves in for that Sustainable Ocean Harvesting Award. We were really keen to learn about how they can use insect proteins to replace the fish derived, you know, that's um, material that's used in fish meal because it's just atrocious to think that we go and literally, you know, scour the ocean for any sort of See seafood biomass to then churn up into put into pellets, which is incredibly inefficient to then go and feed to these aquaculture systems. It's a big scourge of the pressures that we're putting on the ocean at the moment. So they're definitely getting some really good momentum and some good customers on that. But through their journey, which every startup goes through an interesting journey in finding customers, they've actually found lots of other applications in poultry and in you know, pig farms and other different types of protein sources as well. So that was really fascinating. Um, you know, when they do look at that that solution for aquaculture, if you can actually utilize one kilogram of next protein 
as a replacement for fish meal, you can save three kilograms of, of wild caught fish protein as well. So the solution is so profound. It's so strong. Um, and yeah, just really fascinating that they chose to to work with these black soldier flies and figure out a way to to grow them at the kind of scale that they've been able to figure out, obviously with their production facility in Tunisia. Fascinating stuff. And she dives into a lot of really interesting things that I know that maybe in other podcasts haven't been covered, you know, in particular talking about uh, a key achievement actually just being raising funds, which I thought was great because it's not really, so it's, you know, often something that we dive into, but um, often when people are listing key achievements, they often don't actually mention something as simple as, as getting, you know, support and raising, um, raising money, which is very important as a startup. She dives into that, gives some great advice and, you know, on the, the, the topic of, of finding customers, yeah, I think uh, also the, the pet food industry was one of the ones she mentioned, Tim, but on this quest to, to really follow through on trying to um, bust through the kind of fish meal um, part of the aquaculture sector. She said that, you know, it's the dream market to break through. It's important that people are innovating in this space. Um, and that she said, you know, currently if you added all the insect tech companies together, even then they would maybe be able to serve maybe one customer in that space. So there's a lot of scaling up involved from a volume perspective. And, you know, it just proves why startups like Next Protein are so important. And we encourage wholeheartedly startups who are innovating in the sustainable harvesting kind of space to apply for PitchFest 2022, um, which you can do at ocean-impact.org forward slash PitchFest 2022. We are just waiting to have a bunch more Sarinza Muhammad's, who's the other half of Next Protein, to really address this this issue. So I love it as well. I mean, in Pitchfest 2021, of the 12 finalists, three of those startups were led by a couple. So Muhammad and Serena are a couple. We had Geordie and Julia from Great Rap. And of course, we had Simeon and, and Leanne from Aquai. So yeah, pretty cool to know that, you know, that's probably, I'm sure there's some people out there saying, the last thing you want to do is go into business with your loved one. But um, it goes to show it can work. And, and so often, you know, we talk about the power of teams and finding the right co-founder. Well, if you're already figured out how to navigate life together through all its ups and downs, then you probably are quite well placed to, to navigate the trials and tribulations of a startup. So that's a really fascinating fascinating outcome for me on, on PitchFest 2021. It is a, really a crazy statistic to me that of the 12 finalists, three um, are couples. And again, you know, Geordie and Julia from Great Rap also actually in the food waste, uh, utilising food waste for their solution. So, um, and to your point, you know, Sarin said how, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, women can be expected to have to go, you know, career or family or whatever. And she decided that, you know, they were going to find a way to do for both of them to achieve their career aspirations their personal aspirations and also work on you know an area that's important to them it's a great episode guys leave us a comment or a review if you enjoyed it we want to know what parts you love and yeah enjoy i'm thrilled to have on the ocean impact podcast pitch fest 2021 series serene shalala who is the co-founder and the managing director of next protein how are you serene Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. And I'm so excited to have you here today for this conversation. Uh, we were going to have your fellow co-founder and life partner, Mohammed Gasly, as well. Um, but he's looking after the kids. Is that right? Exactly. Somebody has to keep an eye on him. <laughs> Ever since your incredible startup came onto our radar we were just so intrigued and so thrilled to see your very strong application in Pitchfest 2021, which walked away with the Sustainable Ocean Harvesting Spotlight Award um, presented by Austral Fisheries. So let's hear all about it. Tell us about your startup, um, specifically the problem that you're trying to solve with your solution. So as we all know, there are many problems that need solutions currently uh, on the planet. So where do I start? Um, you know, Next Protein, when we started out, we really wanted to provide uh, solutions to two major problems. The first one being uh, food security. We all know, we've heard it, and sometimes we might have heard it so much that it's 
not registering anymore, but the population is literally going to reach 10 billion people by 2050. And you have to feed these people. You know, food production is going to have to increase by 70 percent. Uh, and, you know, people are uh, going to have higher incomes. Uh, you know, our research shows that um, people will spend one third of their increase in income on a, a more varied high protein diet. Um, to give you some figures, I won't bore you too much with numbers, but in 2006, the protein demand was of 64 million tons. And by 2050, it's going to be of 265 million tons. And that's four times more. So you have to feed these people. Um, you know, and then the other problem that we're trying to uh, provide a, solu a solution to is food waste. You know, 30% of food production is wasted. And where does it go? It goes into uh, landfills. It has a very high carbon footprint. There's nothing, not much can be done with it. Um, so, you know, through our uh, insect technology and the business model that we chose, that Next Protein chose, we're able to um, turn these um, low-grade uh, low um, food waste uh, into, you know, proteins. So we're able to reintegrate it into the, 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 the food chain. And that's the only technology out there that's able to do that. It just makes so much sense on paper. Like you said there, we've got all these problems related to global food security and this increasing demand for protein. We've got this horrific problem with food waste. And then along comes nature and insects that have, I'm sure, a voracious appetite. We just need people like yourselves who think, you know what, I can see the problem, join with the solution, I'm going to go down the long, hard road of turning this into a successful business. So this is why we love having these podcast conversations, because we get to learn how on earth this all started. So tell us a little bit about you and about your partner, Muhammad, and how you came to sort of realize the connectivity of those dots and then to position yourselves as being the ones to help create the solution. Yeah. You know, um, I feel like life is is very well designed. Um, you know, Mohammed and I, like you mentioned before, we are life partners, uh, but we're also very different individuals. Um, you know, I have a background in sustainable development. I spent over 10 years uh, working with the United Nations, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, uh, specifically on food security issues linked to climate change. So I would be in the field uh, seeing directly with my own eyes, which really changes everything, uh, the direct impact uh, that climate change is having on already extremely vulnerable populations. So droughts, floods, famine, uh, earthquakes, uh, uh, you know, all of that. And then you have Mohammed, who's an entrepreneur. He had, that's his background. He's also a chemical engineer, so he has the science and he has the, you know, the the entrepre entrepreneur uh, hat. Uh, he was also actually I like I always like to brag about this, but he also produced an album that was Grammy nominated, which is a big deal. Um, <laughs> I had a question actually so um, for Mohammed about that. I was like, tell us about the Grammy nominee, but we can touch that on another yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, you know, because, you know, as a woman also, you know, I, I always, women, we always have to choose, unfortunately, uh, between career and personal life. And I kind of decided that I wasn't going to choose and that I wanted to have it all. Uh, and, you know, having, being in the field so much at some point, it just didn't correlate with being in a marriage. So we decided both of us um, to figure out a way uh, of, of, of creating something together uh, that would, you know, that would uh, provide, provide a, a, um, a solution, let's just say, a solution to our personal and uh, professional ambitions. Um, we're both very sensitive to, to, you know, the climate change issues, to just, you know, having the cleanest life possible. Uh, and having this positive impact on, on, on the planet. And again, like I said before, you know, life is designed so well. Just when we started thinking about this, 
uh, the FAO of the UN released this paper on, um, which is the most downloaded paper in the history of FAO, about the beneficial use of insects. And in parallel, I was in Madagascar working on an anti-locust program, so, you know, an invasion of crickets, uh, and seeing this impact and, and just and, and seeing, you know, people uh, hit by famine and all of these insects and knowing that people consume these insects. Anyway, it, you know how life is just, it, it's amazing. Everything is, is linked. So we started, you know, just researching it uh, and understanding that, first of all, there is no research about it. There is no precedent. There is no material that you can base yourself on. Uh, and we didn't know anything about insects. Um, and so that's, that's really how we started. We started reaching out to people uh, being, you know, told to bugger off, uh, because, you know, we're crazy trying to rear insects on an industrial scale to feed animals to people. What are you talking about? It's insane. And so, you know, we did like every startup, um, we started in my parents. Well, first of all, we quit our jobs, (laughs) uh, and, and, you know, went back home to save some money and um, used my parents' garage uh, as an experiment lab and, you know, got a couple of flies and, you know, my, my mother's kitchen waste and, you know, started from there. And, um, and you know, every time through, you know, step, step after step, every time you think you figured it all out, uh, you realize that you didn't. Uh, and so, you know, you just try to inspire yourself from other, other projects it, it could, and it can even go, you know, from you know poultry production, but it it can also be like the automobile uh, industry. You know, you you kind of inspire yourself from different industries, and you know, m- apply it to your to your project and figure it out and test and try and fail and get back on the horse and just keep on going because when you're convinced you're convinced and we know that this is the the future and that this is uh the right path i can't wait to learn more about what you've achieved in the past 7 or 8 years since you started tinkering um i'd love a little bit more depth into when you did start experimenting with different types of insects and then starting to find potential avenues and ideally customers for your insect protein. Tell us around, tell us about how that went. Um, and that might be a good segue into the actual products that you've developed and that you've commercialized and actually selling now. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, we didn't try other insects. We, before, um, deciding which insect we're going to use, we made sure that we had a clear objective, a clear mission, Uh, and a clear vision. And once we did that, it was easy for us to decide which insect to use. And we decided on the black soldier fly because number one, you know, it's a beneficial insect, which means, you know, it's not, it's not a vector for disease. Uh, If it escapes, uh, it's not going to destroy anything. Um, uh, And it's very, very resilient. Uh, And in addition, it can be fed on pretty much anything. Uh, So for us, that was extremely important uh, when developing our business model because we didn't, it didn't make sense to us to use an insect that, you know, you you would almost have to grow food for it because it kind of defies the purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, So the fact that, you know, the insect can be fed on anything and food waste in particular uh, for us, it closed the deal right away. We were convinced that that was the insect that we wanted to use. Um, and so that's how we started with that. Um, then, um, then, you know, with, with um, clients, how do you know, obviously, if you, if you start out, you have to fully understand whether or not there is a demand for what you're doing. Uh, so, and we're talking about, you know, multinationals and huge corporations that obviously if one Serene Shalala or Mohammed Ghasli emails them, they're not really going to be very responsive. Um, But you know what? We don't give up. We don't give up in my family and we do that. (laughs) And, you know, it's very important to know how to reach out to people and, and who to reach out to. 
uh, you know, so we did that. Um, and we quickly understood that uh, uh, there was a very high demand because even, even um, these multinationals were looking into insects themselves as an alternative. Because at the end of the day, you know, we can all have very altruistic, which we do, we're very altruistic and we want to do good, uh, but money talks. Prices talk. If you're going to provide a solution that's not price competitive, you can be, you know, the best, um, the best intentioned. Uh, it's not going to work. You have to make sure that what you're doing makes sense on the market. Um, and again, that goes back to our business model. You know, uh, the fact that we use this food waste that that is that doesn't cost anything. Uh, the fact that we chose to build our first uh, production facility uh, in Tunisia because, you know, this is, the, you know, insect rearing uh, is in a controlled environment. You need the electricity, you need staff, you need, um, you know, there's, it's very CapEx intensive, I have to say. Um, so it requires a lot of investment. Um, so all of that came into play uh, to be able to have um, a product that is price competitive that would speak to our client who is ready our client has been ready for many years you know for them using using um uh, fish meal is getting more and more expensive uh we know that you know the resources are the resources are depleting it's not you know the oceans are not uh uh what do you call them endless wells you know, there is a limit to what you can do to our end. We, we know that we've reached that limit. Um, so they know they're getting ready. They know that when you talk about something that's innovative, that's never been done, you're going to need a few years of R&D and testing and just making sure that, you know, you fully um, have control and understanding of your process and of your production uh, to then penetrate the, the, the market. So they've been ready. And we're just, you know, getting in there, getting in there and providing like a real concrete solution that's good for the planet. <laughs> so, so exciting. So a couple of questions, um, you know, where predominantly does your food waste come from? And then I'd love to, to loop back and if you could speak specifically to the products that you've developed now, which you can obviously, um, these multinationals and other clients can, can purchase from you guys. We'd love to learn a bit more about those. Yeah. Um, so our food waste essentially, like I, you know, I showed you Tim before where I am. I'm surrounded by farms, uh, and that's a strategic uh, position because that's where our food waste comes from. Um, you know, it was it was very important for us to be placed in an area where we would have access to this food waste in the 50 sur kilometers surrounding because we're not the, the the point is not to have to add on to transportation uh, uh, etc so our food waste comes from you know uh, excessive production sur surplus production uh, it comes from agri businesses you know sometimes they have uh, fruits and vegetables uh, that are not of the right caliber of the right uh, sh uh, shape color whatever it is that end up thrown away but are really very good to eat um, so that's mainly where we, we get our, uh, our food waste. You know, we're part of a, an association called EPIF, which is the um, International Platform for Insect Producers uh, for Food and Feed. It's complicated, I know. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of lobbying within the EU. Uh, the, the association is based in, um, in uh, Brussels. And we do a, a lot of lobbying to, um, to authorize more and more types of waste because concretely the insect, the black soldier fly specifically, could really eat anything. But as you can understand, and it is understandable, it's extremely regulated. So only specific types of waste can be used uh, uh, to feed the insects that would then end up, you know, um, in final product. So speaking of our final product, um, our main product is the uh, protein powder, which is, well, it's flour, it's protein flour, which is used uh, as an ingredient. It could be up to 50% of a, for example, fish pellet. 
uh, uh, it can be used for aquaculture. Uh, it can also be used in uh, pet food for cats and dogs, uh, uh, for chickens, for pigs. You know, it's, it's um, it, it, it could actually be 50% of a final product. Then we have an oil, uh, which is um, a, a source of energy uh, that is also used in uh, as an ingredient for animal feed. Uh, and it also happens to have antimicrobial properties, which are pretty amazing. And then one of our products that initially we didn't fully understand uh, is the fertilizer, you know, the insect frass. Uh, we're very strong actors uh, in the circular economy. So there's literally no waste in our entire process. And one of the wastes is actually a fertilizer. And it, it can be uh, up to 40% of our final production. So it's very, it's, uh, it's quite huge. It has amazing properties. Uh, and so, you know, insect technology has this capacity, this amazing and unique capacity, and it's the only technology out there, to be able to provide, uh, you know, a solution to animal nutrition as ingredients, but also plant nutrition. So we're always, always giving back. I, I sit here listening to this solution and, and you talking about it, and you've really kind of cracked the code and we, we are going to get to a conversation about some of the challenges that you face but what an achievement that you you set out to to crack this code this beautiful circular model and you're up and running and uh and really delivering results so just congratulations i i really am so inspired by what you've achieved thank you so much tim i appreciate it it's a lot of Tell hard us, work <laughs> yeah and well, we'll talk about that in a minute but i'd love to just obviously ocean impact pitch fest so tell us specifically about this sort of segment that you're servicing around aquaculture and and fish meal replacements because that that really is where the ocean impact sweet spot is and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the the diversity that you have in your customer base how much is going to aquaculture versus going to other industries just give us a little bit of a a spiel about your real ocean impact if you wouldn't mind mm -hmm. So when you, when you work on something that's innovative, that's never been done, um, it takes time, as you can understand. Uh, a lot of R&D, a lot of scaling up. You know, people, people often seem to think that, you know, insect production is just getting a couple of insects and they're going to do what they do. And then you, you can, you can expand, exponentially grow. Uh, but it's not. It's very technical. It doesn't work like that at all. The, the different stages of scaling up are a challenge in, in themselves. Uh, when we started out, it was obvious for us that we wanted to penetrate the, the aquaculture sector. Uh, so providing a solution to fish meal. Um, but we're talking about a humongous market, which requires humongous quantities. Uh, and I was, you know, mentioning about the scale up. Um, you know, today, if you kind of combine all of the major insect producers in the world, um, you might be able to, uh, to, to, to sell to one client and maybe not enough. You know, no one is able yet to produce the quantities. And with anything, um, with anything innovative, there is a, a ramp up stage. So the ultimate goal is definitely fish meal. And, you know, we're working on doing a lot of research and development uh, uh, on that, you know, with uh, selling uh, with, with uh, samples and testing to make sure, you know, uh, the product is good for the fish, what kind of fish uh, it's good for, what the impact is uh, on, the, on the fish. Uh, but through the ramp up, you know, there is the pet food sector, which also has a very positive um, uh, impact uh, on the planet. Uh, so a lot of people with pets uh, want to feed them better quality, more sustainable products. So you have that. And then, you know, the poultry market uh, and the pig markets uh, are huge. But ultimately, the fish, the fish market is the goal. Uh, but we're scaling up to that for now. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, you mentioned a lot in your presentations and talks just how big those uh, markets are for fish meal. And of course, the the impact they are having on an already stretched ocean and ocean resources and how it's growing at such an extreme rate, doubling by 2030. And it's uh, it's scary. So we do need you and, 
and many others like you to to try and penetrate that market to relieve that pressure on the oceans. Can you speak at all to what those industries are doing to the ocean and, and maybe it's about the specific fisheries that they're targeting? I mean, you must know quite a bit about the the pressures that those industries are putting on the ocean. Do you want to give us any sort of snapshot on on just how significant they are? I mean, I think I'm a doer and I'm a seer. Uh, I think, you know, um, just just generally, um, you know, being being a kid of the sea, of the Mediterranean Sea, and just seeing, you know, even as a child, all the, the plastic waste, uh, seeing how, you know, year after year, I wouldn't see those little fish in my feet, um, how the temperature of the water has risen. It's like, it's, it's very scary how much the temperature of the water has risen. Um, how some summers we couldn't swim because uh, there were too many jellyfish. And why were there too many jellyfish? Because of the temperature of the water, because, you know, the, the sea turtles uh, got stuck in the nets. Um, I think that speaks for itself and, uh, on, on uh, what it is that we're doing to our oceans, where, you know, sometimes you walk into the sea and, and you have to push that plastic bag and you have to push that plastic bottle to actually get in the water. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned before that, uh, I have kids and, um, I, you know, I'm, I fear that they won't be able to enjoy the summers that I enjoyed as a kid. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult subject because we all know about overfishing, uh, about aggressive, uh, aggressive, uh, fishing methods and, you know, uh, not respecting quotas and all of these very philosophical quotas uh, where, you know, if you don't use your quota, you can give it to someone else. And, you know, these things, these things um, are an insult to our planet sometimes, I feel. And we're, we're not very respectful to it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, my motivation is really my children, just for them to be able to um, enjoy their summers like uh, I, I used to. Uh, it, you know, for example, uh, today in, um, in Europe, um, I think, uh, I don't want to make a mistake, but I think maybe 60% of, of the fish meal that's used for the aquaculture industry uh, comes from, you know, Latin America, from like Chile, uh, Ecuador, you know, and 20% of wild caught fish are used for the aquaculture sector. I don't know if we can visualize how much that is. That's, uh, you know, a lot. And with, with the insect technology, you know, I, I always like to use this uh, metaphor. Well, it's not a metaphor. It's a fact. It's, you know, one kilo of uh, our product saves three to five kilos of uh, fish in the sea. And, I think, you know, that's very, that's very powerful and uh, a great motivation. And, and we're always working towards optimizing that and making it even more. Yeah. And again, I think that's just another reason that no doubt, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the challenges that you've been through, but I suppose to why so many people are backing you and want you to succeed, because those kinds of figures are just devastating, coupled with the fact that we know more and more now about the vulnerability of these uh, ecosystems, fish stocks, uh, and the ocean broadly. So let's talk about some of those achievements, um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing some of your key achievements over the journey so far. Um, well, already, you know, rearing insects on an industrial scale in itself is a major achievement. Uh, again, because it's never been done, because it's extremely technical, uh, and you know a lot of a lot of work and research has gone into that. Um, you know, the second one of the one of our other achievements is raising funds. Trying, you know, when we started out in 2013, reaching out to people randomly on LinkedIn, letting them know that this is what we're doing. Uh, 
uh, we're going to rear insects. And uh, if you want to come visit, I have a bucket full of waste and a couple of flies and an Ikea tent. Uh, please give me millions of dollars. I mean, trying to explain that to people is, 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 is very difficult. So, you know, our first achievement, I think, is that we fully understood how important it was uh, to surround ourselves with the right people when we were fundraising. So initially for our seed round, uh, we reached out, I mean, easily to thousands of people, thousands of people, uh, cold emails, cold calls, uh, you know, just being, being again, told, sent off, uh, no replies. Um, and we never gave up. And then you have to meet that one person, that one person that believes in you uh, and not only believes in you in a way that, um, that motivates you, uh, because of their background and their, uh, you know, th- th- this particular angel investor, you know, knew nothing about what we do and, and didn't particularly ever invest in anything sustainable. Um, but he believed in us. And, uh, you know, not only did that motivate us, but he also, you know, um, uh, helped us kind of, he, you know, he shared, he shared our adventure with other people and spread the word. Um, and that helped um, a lot. So raising funds in something that's innovative, that's never been done uh, by two people who um, didn't necessarily know anything about insects, uh, who happened to also be a couple <laughs> in life. Um, that was uh, that was uh, a, an achievement. And we continue, you know, um, every step of the way. It's every time we raise funds, it's an achievement. I mean, the last. Um, fundraising that we did was in March 2020, which was uh, literally when the whole world shut down. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, there was a lot of collateral damage. A lot of companies and startups lost their way. Um, and we were able to still fundraise and we continued. And we have amazing teams that are so dedicated that, you know, some of them were like, no, I, I, can't, I can't use transport because of COVID. I'm just going to sleep. I'm going to sleep here uh, and keep an eye on the flies. You know, people, you know, when you have teams like that, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, amazing. And that's another achievement. Our team, uh, our amazing international young team that we have that's a major major achievement you know we have our headquarters are in paris uh we have a a couple of offices uh, in france and then we have this first production site in tunisia Uh, and you know doing that in tunisia and getting all of this international investment in tunisia is a major major achievement you know people might not have the best uh, perception of Tunisia, uh, um, but we've we've definitely proven proven them wrong. And you know, our team is on average maybe 30, 30, 30 years old. You know, agronomists, uh, technicians, uh, workers, and they're you know they're they're the reason why we're able to continue doing what we're doing. So that's a, a very amazing and beautiful achievement. Oh, thank you for sharing. They are really, really amazing achievements. Um, I wonder, I'm sure people that are on a startup journey really caught on to the success around fundraising. Is there a couple of things that you can reflect back on now and say, perhaps the reason we did well with fundraising is because of X, Y, and Z? Like, is there a couple of things that you think are lessons and learnings that might be really helpful to people out there with big ambitions, but don't quite know how to tackle fundraising? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing um, that I, I definitely know that we did well was be prepared. Be prepared means, you know, um, knowing you, what you're doing, having a clear vision, uh, uh, but also being able to listen listen to people people you know you might you might think you know your your idea is perfect the way it is uh which maybe it is but you have to be able to listen to people to experts to more experienced people um and learn from them and uh um 
make that's that's extremely important actually be be prepared and listen to people um i think um i think having no fear uh is a, is a great lesson that i've 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 gotten from the fundraising both mohammed and i uh we we have no fear <laughs> um we're not scared of bothering people uh of just reaching out to random people of knocking on their door because you know we're not doing this for ourselves we're doing this for the planet and that's motivation there's i'm not backing down there's no way i'm backing down we're, there's no way we're backing down uh and god knows that you know we've been through a lot of hurdles um but resilience resilience is another key key lesson never give up but know when to give up that's the thing <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's move on to, to challenges then. I'm sure there's been plenty, but maybe you've got a few that you'd like to share for the listeners around the, some of the challenges you've faced. Yeah. Um, so um, I always like to say that, you know, we didn't um, choose the easiest of paths. Um, first of all, we decided that we were going to give um, uh, organic uh, food waste to our insects. That, uh, that's a huge uh, difficulty and challenge because, you know, there's, you know, insects need an optimized meal. So there's humidity uh, that needs to be respected. There's texture. There's, uh, um, you know, every, it's, it's very important to have the perfect recipe to uh, ensure you have a, a high quality and stable production. And what we're doing is, you know, the food waste that we're using, you know, today it's oranges, tomorrow it's watermelons, uh, the next day it's apples, uh, and you have to be able to use whatever you get and have a stable, high quality product. Um, so that was um, something that was um, uh, very challenging for us. Oranges one day, apples and watermelons the next, like, that's a challenge. What? What was the solution that came out of it? What did you learn how to do to optimize the feed? R&D, a lot, a lot of research and development and developing uh, an in-house tool that is basically, to, to simplify it, uh, uh, that is, you, you know, you put in whatever you get and it gives you a formula of something that is optimal. But to do that, you have to really understand uh, what the insect needs for its optimal growth. So, you know, uh, that's a lot, a lot uh, of work that goes into it to create this perfect formula for optimized growth. Gotcha. Okay, so that's one challenge is figuring out what the flies love to devour and, uh, and how. Any other mm -hmm. sort of major challenges that come to mind when you're thinking about the journey, challenges that you'd like to, to share with the listener? Um, yes. Um, so... Uh, well, not knowing anything about uh, the insects, obviously, <laughs> that, that's a major challenge. But the important challenges really are to be prepared uh, when you implement a project that is innovative uh, like ours in a country. You know, uh, if you're going to deal with, you know, human food or animal feed, then uh, you have to make sure you have a full understanding of the uh, legal framework. That's very important. Um, when you start off, um, uh, you know, you should be smart about not putting all of the investment in before making sure that, first of all, you're, you have the right authorizations to do what you're doing uh, and that you can get those authorizations. So really, Mohammed and I, when we started out, we spent a lot of time doing research on the legal framework, understanding that because this has never been done, there were no laws that were, you know, guiding us through the process. So you have to reach out to the ministries, to the local authorities. You have to work in partnership with them um, to be able to do that. That's extremely uh, important and vital because at the end of the day, if you're going to invest and then the, the legal framework doesn't follow, then you're going to lose everything. So that was extremely important. Apart from the technical aspects of what we do, it's the whole administrative uh, and legal uh, uh, framework that you have to ensure is in place and set up uh, to enable you to move forward with your project and with your idea. 
Um, and that was, yeah, that was very difficult. We're very lucky um, to, to have been accompanied, have um, how we were uh, by the Tunisian authorities. Um, and, you know, that's that's something that now we have in our in our baggage. That's something that we've learned. We're able now to be to to go to any country in the world and know what the different steps are to implement our uh, our production facility. And that's actually those those are part of the next steps. It's our uh, international expansion. Uh, and, you know, we're looking uh, into having um many, many more production facilities in different parts of the world, in uh, North and Southern America and Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you know, that's part of the next steps um, that we're, we're looking into. And we know what to do every time we go into a country. We know uh, what we have to look for. We know what kind of authorizations we have to make sure we have uh, in order to do that. Wow. Yeah, that is that is huge. And obviously having the support in Tunisia and, and going through those hurdles, over those hurdles, around and under them, um, has now set you up for that international expansion, which is super exciting. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about what uh, Next Protein has on the horizon for the next year or two. We'd love to learn more. Yeah. Um, so we're working on our uh, fundraising. Uh, so the Series B fundraising. Um, that's something that we just uh, started working on. And this uh, fundraising is going to allow us uh, to work on our international expansion, as I mentioned before. Uh, we have, you know, give, with our business model, we're able to um, create uh, m- what we call modular production facilities which means that we can adapt the size of our production facility to whatever available um, uh, low-grade food waste uh, uh, is in any specific country. So that's mainly what we're going to be working on for the next uh, 12 to 24 months. As you can imagine, that's already a a lot of work. Um, And um, another um, major... um, project that we're working on is opening up our second production facility here uh, in Tunisia. Hopefully that will be up and running early um, next year. Uh, You know, just the main objective now is uh, increase capacity, scale up, uh, expand, you know, open new markets, access these new markets. Um, and well, through the fundraising, those are really the, the major next steps that we have. Wow. Well, you're not going to be, uh, having too much rest then in the near future. That sounds like a lot of work on your plate. Tell us a little bit more about your team and and maybe a little bit about how you personally, um, are navigating the journey of becoming so, so responsible for the business and obviously for the growing workforce. Yeah. Um, Our team, our amazing team. So we have, like I mentioned before, we have a headquarters in uh, in Paris uh, where we deal with all the marketing, business development, business development strategy and the research. And also we do what we call industrialization, which is basically, you know, again, with with innovation come a lot of challenges. And one of them is uh, the fact that, you know, processing machines for insects didn't exist. So you really have to start from scratch. You can just go to a store and buy a processing machine for insects. <laughs> so we have people who are dedicated uh, to that. Amazing young people. Um, and then we have our production facility here in Tunisia. Today, we're uh, almost 80 people. Um, more than 80 people uh, of essentially, you know, agronomists, uh, any type of, uh, uh, of engineer, really, uh, technicians, uh, um, and just the workforce. Um, it's, it's, it's very, um, it, was, it was a long and, and difficult path, you know, building this team, um, uh, you know, when you're when you're looking to hire people to uh, work on such a project, it's not like you can just you know find these insect experts. There's no such thing. So 
Um, one thing that, you know, I think Mohammed and I did right, uh, hum- I say this with a lot of uh, humility, uh, but is, is actually having done the work ourselves. We're like, we literally went and picked up, you know, the food waste and put our hands in it and, you know, did the, the whole, we did the whole thing. So we know, we know what we're talking about. And when you ask people um, uh, to do that, and it's not always, you know, initially when you, when you, when you, we, we were still small and not at an industrial scale, it's not easy to, to, um, to be, you know, diving into waste <laughs> buckets. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've done it, so we know. Um, and so that's, that's definitely something, uh, you know, you have to be able to teach people and then uh, build them up so they can also then, you know, continue teaching other people uh and that's it's a lot of responsibility because these are you know some of them join us and they're you know 21 22 years old uh they've never had that much responsibility but when you join next protein i always tell them you have to teach me i'll teach you a few things but then you have to start teaching me and that's a lot of responsibility uh but they're really stepping up to the plate uh i think it's it's really it's really uh, beautiful, actually, to see how motivated they are. You know, they treat the flies like their own kids. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but it was a challenge. You know, it, it was a challenge finding people who, who wanted to work in such a sector. You know, agriculture is not the most glamorous sector. Uh, people often don't perceive it as such. You know, a lot of that's part of the problem in agriculture is that a lot of young people are leaving uh, uh, the sector. And so, you know, how being able to motivate them and to share our vision with them and then now they share the vision with us was quite the challenge. Uh, but, uh, you know, these, we always say we're a big family uh, and, uh, and we, work, we all work hard together for, for all of us together. You know, it's, the result is going to benefit all of us. And uh, I really feel that motivation in, in, in our team. And, um, I've never, I had never managed so, so many people, obviously before, uh, but um, but I feel like again, it's like a family, so it's not, um, it, it comes organically, uh, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> I love that attitude and, and that culture. Like, I'll teach you a few things, but you're also here to teach me some things too. That's a really beautiful takeaway. <laughs> um, speaking of takeaways, we're at that stage of the podcast now where we ask our guests just to share some key learnings. What are some little wisdoms that you've uh, picked up along your journey, along your career that imagine there's some startup entrepreneurs, uh, some founders out there tuning in going, this woman is fascinating. What can I learn and what can I take away from this podcast? <laughs> um, I think, I think um, one of the most important takeaways to have is that we have to learn to listen, to listen to people, to um, um, be open-minded uh, and, and learn, learn fast. Um, you know, I, I always like to say that, um, you know, Mohammed and I are the founders, but building the team, it was important for us to, uh, have smarter people than us in our team. I love that. I love having smarter people than me. It, it goes back to, you know, you teach me, um, that's very important. Um, so yeah, the takeaway is listening, learning. Uh, being flexible, you know, we can have a lot of great ideas. A great idea is just a great idea. At the end of the day, it's just a great idea. Execution is everything. If you have a great idea and you don't know how to execute it correctly, it's not going to work. And to execute it correctly, you have to surround yourself by the right people. You have to be fearless and reach out to those people, even if they tell you, you know, uh, who are you? I don't want to speak to you or hang up the phone on you. You can't be you can't be fearful of that. Uh, And and also don't be alone. Entrepreneurship is a a very lonely job. And um, when you found a company, it's better to be at least two people so you can, you know, motivate each other, feed each other 
pull each other up when the other one is down. Um, I think that's extremely vital, actually. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, to be an entrepreneur and do it by yourself. Um, and yeah, I think learning, listening, being flexible, uh, you know, um, being capable of adapting your, your solution uh, to the demand is very important. Um, you know, you can't come into a market and say, no, this is what you need. You have to listen to the, to the market. The market will tell you what the market needs. And that's part of, you know, succeeding, I think. And, you know, I don't, I don't like using the term succeeding that much because, you know, it's, we, st we still have a long path ahead of us and we're still working hard. And, you know, I feel, I feel uh, um, you know, we've, we've definitely achieved many, many amazing things, uh, but we still have a long path ahead. And um, people, you know, people um, around us um, should, to help, should, you know, um, be more open-minded uh, and, uh, and, you know, support us through, you know, talking about it, talking about our types of solutions, not having this, um, this, you know, with insects, there's this yuck factor. I don't know if you've heard of the yuck factor. People are like, ew, insects. But really, um, we're going back to a naturality. This is what humans, humans have eaten for centuries. This is what fish eat. Um, you know, this is nature. This is nature, and nature has given us this beautiful gift. Um, so support us on our path. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the solution will benefit all of us. There's a nice takeaway for people that are still listening to this episode. You've got a job to do today is to help deconstruct the yuck factor in someone that you speak to after you've listened to this podcast. Tell them that insects are just natural and we all need to start appreciating them in all parts of life. Um, okay, <laughs> Serena, it's now that time where we can just sort of close up the conversation. Perhaps there's some things that you wanted to speak to today that you haven't had the chance to get to yet. And if not, you can just finish up by telling people where they can support your journey and follow you. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. This was a, a very fun podcast. I hope people will uh, enjoy listening to it. Um, you can uh, reach out to us on LinkedIn. We have uh, Next Protein on LinkedIn. That's the main uh, point of contact. Uh, we have a Facebook page and Instagram. Please check us out. We'll tell you about uh, our flies' adventures and what they're going through. Uh, just follow us and, and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions or, or anything. We'll gladly hear from you. Well, thank you so much to you, to Muhammad, and to the entire team. You've inspired me, and I don't need a lot of help to get inspired, but I hope everyone out there is also inspired, and we just want to say keep up the fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the support. You can't take the ocean.